What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. Today, we're still recovering from that New York Giants loss on Sunday night. It was an ugly one. It was very disappointing, and the Giants are now 2-4. and four. And if you're looking ahead to the next few weeks here, crucial game coming up against the Philadelphia Eagles. There's a game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, who are a pretty damn good team, although maybe going through a quarterback change, so we'll see once the Giants face them what they're looking like. And then the Panthers, then the bye week. But during that bye week, the NFL trade deadline. And so now there's become a little bit of a discussion with the Giants in last place in the NFC East, with them at 2-4, and four, do they need to start looking ahead to the deadline and becoming sellers, maybe making some trades? Now, there's been a few trades this season. There was a blockbuster trade that just went down today. The New York Jets just acquired Devontae Adams. The Giants aren't going to make any splash moves like that, and they don't have any splash players to trade like that. But could they make some lesser moves? Could they maybe pick up a draft pick somewhere by trading away Aziz Ojolari is a popular name now, especially considering the performance that he had in week six against the Bengals. Two sacks, six pressures, looked like a dominant force at times. Now there are some Giants fans that think, capitalize on that. You trade him away while his value is high and go ahead and get yourself a draft pick. Now, I have some thoughts on that. Alex has some thoughts on that. We're going to go ahead and kind of debate this. Uh, I think Ad, Ad, Alex is going to play a little bit of devil's advocate because I'm pretty firm in my stance of keeping Aziz Ojolari. But I also do want to discuss the offense, Alex, and I think we can start there because we've talked a lot about the offense. This is probably bound to be a quick discussion, but Wandale Robinson had a very interesting quote today. And you know what? So did Brian Dable. The topic of conversation today between the media and the Giants was the lack of explosiveness on offense. Brian Dable said he's very frustrated by it. He's upset. He knows that it's something that he needs to do better is create more explosive plays for the offense. Meanwhile, Wandale Robinson, I'm paraphrasing here, had a quote where he said, you only get a few opportunities a game to hit on those 40, 50 yard plays, those big passes downfield, those explosive opportunities. You only get a few of them. So you have to make the most of every single one. And hey, that's kind of what we've been saying for the last six weeks, Alex. We've been saying that every single day on the show that, The problem isn't that Daniel Jones is, you know, just awful. It's that those few moments when the margin for error is so small for a bad Giants team, right? When when you need to hit a play, he just doesn't seem to hit it. Whether it's a deep 20 plus yard pass and it's off the mark or it's a crucial fourth down under prime time. Those few moments, they are few and far between that you face them. And if you don't capitalize on them, it will ultimately sink you. That's pretty much what Wando Robinson was saying. I know that you have the full quote that you'll read out, Alex. But this offense, it's a little bit broken right now. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it's not creating explosive plays. What is your reaction to Wando Robinson and Brian Dable expressing their frustration with the lack of explosiveness? I mean, look, look, guys, we have two key components of this offense now saying that it's not enough, right? Brian Dable specifically, like verbatim said, we are not generating enough explosive plays. Who is not generating enough explosive plays? I mean, I certainly see Darius Slayton open downfield sometimes. I saw Wandale streaking across the middle of the field open yesterday. I've seen guys open. You know what I mean? I've seen Malik Neighbors for the first four weeks wide open on multiple occasions downfield. Who is not generating explosive plays? It is Daniel Jones, right? It's Daniel Jones, guys. Like, we can't beat around the bush here. Uh, We're talking about 21 attempts, 20-plus yards downfield. He's connected on five of them. And, by the way... 8.7% 8.7% turnover-worthy play percentage on those throws. That is horrible, right? Mostly because they're overthrown or underthrown. They have, they're giving, he's giving defensive players opportunities to intercept these, these passes um, because of how inaccurate he's been. He had two really good throws against the Seattle Seahawks. But now that's an anomaly, right? Over a large sample size, that's an anomaly. Um, a lot of his 20-plus yard throws have been after the catch. They've been, they've been throws that have been uh, you know caught and taken beyond this beyond that and it's unfortunate that we have to sit here and talk about how limited the Giants offense is now look I'm not I'm not blaming Daniel Jones for everything it's a team sport a lot goes into it Jalen Hyatt's not playing very well you know he's he's doing some stuff but he's not doing enough Darius Slayton's dropping passes left and right Wanda Robinson's dropped in passes left and right even neighbors was dropping passes they had a bad offensive line performance this past week there are variables that do impact the entire offense's production, and it's not just relying on Daniel Jones. But if you're being paid $40 million and you have an open receiver downfield and a clean pocket, you need to hit those throws every single time. Even players, like people, there's somebody in my Twitter comments saying, well, Joe Burrow missed a wide open receiver. Like, you know, you don't talk about that. Joe Burrow won. 
Joe Burrow beat us. Nobody gives a shit whether or not you miss a throw if you win the game. You know, if Daniel Jones won the game and they won because of him, then nobody's going to care about the misses because that means he hit other plays that were more explosive and big ones. I watched Joe Burrow roll out to his left side and throw a, b- a ball across his body to Andreas Yosivas for like a 30-yard gain for a completion on third and 16. You know what I mean? To, to ice the game, to win that game. That's what the difference is. I watched Daniel Jones miss a wide-open Wondell Robinson on 4th and 5 to keep the game alive. I watched him throw a ball to, I think it was Darius Slater. Maybe it was, maybe it was high. I forget who it was. Maybe it was Hodgins. And he was, he was covered up. He had a guy in the flat that was wide open for a first down. Like, he's not moving through his progressions. These are the same problems we see week in and week out. But here's the truth, guys. I don't want to stick around and talk about Daniel Jones because, in my opinion, and I'll throw this out there, Anthony, if the Giants lose to the Eagles and they lose their third straight NFC East divisional game, in a division, by the way, that is not very good this year, the Dallas Cowboys, if you saw what Jerry Jones said, he is imploding right now. He looks like he's one more loss away from firing the entire coaching staff. That's how quickly that stuff could unfold there. They look like they're about to explode. The Eagles... Nick Sirianni is using his child to shield himself from the press. I don't know if you guys saw that. That was actually ridiculous. He had his child up there when he was about to get reamed out by the press for almost losing to the Browns. They were about to crucify him, and he brought his kid up there so they wouldn't, they wouldn't attack him. Um, I, that's what it looked like, at least from the media perspective, and everyone was talking about it, and that was the narrative. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ride with that for now. If you have a different take, that's fine. Um, but in any case, the Eagles don't look like a good football team. Jalen Hurts does not look like a great quarterback right now. Their defense is getting shredded. The only team that looks worth a damn right now is the Commanders because they have a quarterback who's playing at a high level. The Giants have a chance right now. That This is a very – and I want to make this clear. The Giants roster is not bad, right? They have a couple of really good linchpin pieces. The depth, yes, could use some more support, but next year's draft you know, will hopefully help solidify those things. And we'll talk about Aziz Ojolari as a key component of that conversation right now. But if the Giants had a quarterback right now, they'd be probably the best team in this division. I, I I don't really think that that's a far-fetched thing to say. The roster's pretty damn good. We have a superstar with the best defensive player in the game. One of the best left tackles when he's healthy. Last week, he was playing injured. We have one of the best young receivers all in the league right now, Malik Neighbors. And the defense, I mean, Brian Burns is playing like an all-pro level player, whether you see it in the stats or not. You know, he is playing an excellent, excellent ball right now. We have a tremendous linebacker in Bobby Okereke, a really, really strong, uh, you know, rookie slot corner um, and Andrew Phillips, we have a, a solid free safety, and Tyler Newbin's been playing really, really good football recently. And then Tra- Tyrone Tracy, a fifth rounder, is tearing it up. 100, uh, 100 all purpose yard games in two consecutive weeks. R- if the Giants had the quarterback, I think this would be a good football team. Um, the problem is they don't. And the problem is they can't generate explosive plays. So, you know, Anthony, I'll let you get your take on the NFC East right now, the kind of the situation unfolding. I don't think the Giants would be that far off from being the top team in the division if we had a quarterback who could just hit those throws score touchdowns not settle for 45 yard field goals or your backup kicker trying to hit them you know what i mean like yeah the kicker should have made them field goals but he's kicking he's a he's a guy that just stepped in like two weeks ago and is being expected to hit 40 plus yard field goals in windy metlife stadium like that's a losing recipe guys everyone knows that <laughs> you know what i mean um sure he should be hitting them but again we don't have our starting kicker we're like leaning up backup it's just it's a losing recipe man that's this is how you lose games This is how you lose games. The New York Giants have lost a lot of games in recent years, and obviously Sunday's night is one that we're still trying to process and evaluate, and yeah, a lot of fans are right. The kicker has to make those kicks. There were a few gaps on both sides of the ball, like the Giants weren't perfect, but that kind of highlights the main argument here, Alex. The game shouldn't have to be perfect for the quarterback to find a way to win, right? If we're talking about a good quarterback, a franchise quarterback, we're talking about the Joe Burrows and Josh Allens of the world. Obviously, Daniel Jones is not in that same conversation as much as Giants fans want him to be. Those guys, when things aren't perfect, find ways to win. They get their team in the end zone. Daniel Jones struggles to get in the end zone. You know, that's really just what it comes down to is when things aren't perfect, it is a team game and your kicker has to make your field goals and your head coach has to make sure there is a healthy kicker in the lineup and all of those things if you want to revert back to week two there's so many different opportunities that the Giants had to win games and maybe Daniel Jones is the reason they lost maybe somebody else is the reason they lost but at the end of the day that's the argument it shouldn't have to be everything perfect around Daniel Jones for him to win but I do kind of want to give my takes on the NFC East conversation that you were just having Alex and a few points that you made 
Right now, the NFC East is very bad. Uh, the Commanders look like a great team. I, I think even if the Giants did have a star quarterback, they probably wouldn't be better than the Commanders. The Commanders are really good, in my opinion. I think they're very well coached. Both sides of the ball has a lot of talent there, and they have a star quarterback, which really is the difference maker. But that's a, that's a good football team. You know, if the Giants had Josh Allen, that's different. But, you know, they don't. So... When you're looking at this division and where things are, the Giants are not out of the race. You know, one way or another, we're two and four. If we win next week against the Eagles, we're three and four. And the Eagles are three and three because they are coming off of a bye week recently. So the Giants are right back in the race. Now, are they really in the race? Like, do you really feel confident that they can get into the race and maybe get ahead at some point? That's the question. And if you don't feel that way, then, you know, it's kind of tough to envision a bright future for this team. But how do you spark that win? Like, how do you spark a run? How do you get back in the race if you don't have confidence that your quarterback can keep you in it? Then it becomes a conversation of, all right, the Giants are still in this race, so why would they bench their quarterback? If their quarterback has kept them in the race so far, why would they bench him? And then you can argue the other way around. The quarterback is the reason that they're not further ahead in the race. They need to bench him and spark something and get back in the race. There's many different ways that you can look at this. Like It's a totally nuanced conversation. There's a lot of different perspectives that you could take. But the end-all, be-all is Brian Dable has to understand he is playing for his future. Now, I think his job is safe at the end of the year. I think it's very obvious this team has made progress. They still fight hard for him. He will be the head coach in 2025. But if he wants to be a playoff head coach, if he wants to get this team back into the postseason, I think he's going to recognize that a change needs to be made, whether it be in play calling or whether it be at the quarterback position, whatever. Something has to change because the Giants right now technically are not out of the race, but if they do lose to Philadelphia, they will be out of the race. And then if you make the quarterback change after that, it's kind of too little too late. So, you know, and they're not going to make it this week. So it's really just going to be the end-all be-all of the playoff race is this week, in my opinion. This is a must-win game for the New York Giants. Thankfully, Jalen Hurts has struggled against the Giants all throughout his career. I just posted some stats on Twitter. He has a 4-2 record against us, but he has a 5-6 to touchdown to interception ratio against us. I, that doesn't add up to me, how the Giants keep beating up on Jalen Hurts, but the Eagles keep beating up on the Giants. That just feels cursed. I don't like that. We need to change that narrative this upcoming Sunday. Like, I need the Giants to win this game. But if they don't, like I said, they're probably out of the race. We're talking about quarterback conversations. We're talking about maybe getting Tommy DeVito back in action. That's totally possible. And we're probably talking about being sellers at the trade deadline. And that's where the Aziz Ojolari conversation comes into place here. Do the Giants trade these players who have their value boosted right now? It's not just Ojolari. It's also Darius Slayton. He's been making a lot of plays. Yeah, he had a concussion a couple weeks ago, but he didn't miss any time due to that. He had 120 yards against the Seahawks. He should have had over 100 yards against uh, Cincinnati, but he got a play called back because of a legal man downfield. Those two players are playing well. And if you read around in the different media outlets, like I saw one today from Pro Football Focus, they said that the Giants need to be sellers at the trade deadline, get rid of those two players, add some draft picks, move ahead towards the future. I'm going to stand here and say I disagree. And I'll give you a reason why for both of those players, Alex. I know we wanted to focus it on Ojolari, but I'll even give my take on Darius Slayton. Darius Slayton can't be traded away because Jalen Hyatt is bad at football right now. He is not somebody that I can rely on to give me 60 quality snaps across 60 minutes of a football game. At that point, we're talking about going from Darius Slayton to probably Isaiah Hodgins, because I don't think Jalen Hyatt can play a full game as a starting wide receiver for the New York Giants right now. He's been that bad. He's never open. When he is open, he drops passes, or if the ball is lightly contested, it's way too contested for Jalen Hyatt. So right now, Darius Slayton is necessary to the success, the success of this team. And when we're talking about, all right, we're already out of the race. So what does the success of this team matter? Well, it matters for Brian Dable's job and it matters for the players in the locker room. You can't just trade away your best players. That's demoralizing. It's just a big F you to all of the players in there who are competing their asses off for 60 minutes every Sunday. So for me, Darius Slayton, while he is a nice trade piece, I'm sure the Chiefs would love to have him. The Buffalo Bills would certainly love to have Darius Slayton He is a necessary component of this New York Giants team. I would not trade him. And then with Ojolari, a lot of fans are looking at this as, well, he just had a great performance, maximize his value, go ahead and trade him, capitalize on the value while it's high. I'm looking at it as, he just got in there in one spot start, flashed all of this great potential, has an expiring contract. If that was his potential, if that's the level that he can play at consistently when healthy, the contract that he would get would be astronomically different compared to the one that he's going to get. So if the Giants hold on to Ojolari and then extend him, 
you're actually getting a great talent on a bargain contract just due to prior injury history. And I like contracts like that because all it takes is one year where the guy doesn't get injured and actually stays healthy. And you have one of the best bargain contracts in the entire sport at a premium position, which is edge rusher. So I don't think the third, fifth, or sixth round pick that you get for Ojolari by trading him, I don't think you're going to get that kind of value out of that player that you drafted in 2025 compared to the value that you're getting from a former second round pick in Aziz Ojolari. So that's my stance on those two players. Alex, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I know there are a lot of fans that want those two traded, but for me personally, I think Darius Slayton, necessary to the offense, Aziz Ojolari could be a bargain player if the Giants choose to extend him this offseason. Yeah, so I'm going to play a devil's advocate here and talk about, you know, what the Giants could get or what could happen here. So we don't know if he'll be extended, right? Like, they would probably have to extend him now-ish or this during the season uh, to guarantee that he'll be here in the future. Um, does he want to stay here? Can they guarantee him a starting spot? You know, like, next year you still have Kayvon Thibodeau and Brian Burns. Like, is is Ezekiel really starting? He might be able to go elsewhere, kind of like... Uh, Lorenzo Carter is a good example of a player that kind of underwhelmed with the Giants. Now he's starting for the Falcons or, you know, Devin uh, Kennard a couple years ago when he went to the Lions and he was starting. Like there are guys that were with the Giants as kind of backups who went on to have starting careers elsewhere. Can the Giants guarantee Ojolari that he's going to be a starter next season? I'm not so sure unless they say to him, well, if you beat out Kayvon, you know, it's your, it's your job to lose. Uh, and with the way he's been performing lately, there's a good argument to say that when healthy, he is better than Kayvon Thibodeau. So uh, there is an argument that maybe you want to extend him for that reason, but he'd also have to acknowledge that he may lose that job instead of being guaranteed, like, yeah, like, you're our starter. Um, like, like you said, he's probably going to be pretty affordable because of his injury history. Maybe you look at like a, let's say a three-year deal with an out after the second season. That kind of seems realistic for a guy like Ojolari. Maybe he wants a one-year, like, prove-it deal as a starter. That could also be something that kind of stands out for him. Maybe a team like, I don't know, the Jets uh, kind of make a lot of sense, or Detroit right now. Uh, he goes to a really, really good team in Detroit with Aiden Hutchinson, Hutchinson just breaking his leg. I know they have a second-round pick and a fourth-round pick, I believe. They don't have a third. Um, so, you know... What can you get from Aziz Ojolari? We've made this mistake in the past where, like, we assume we would just extend them, whether it be with a guy like Xavier McKinney, whether it be a guy like Saquon Barkley. When we – now in hindsight, we're like, we should have traded them. You know, we, we could have gotten really solid draft capital by moving them prematurely because we knew we probably weren't bringing them back. Um, however, when it comes to a guy like Ojolari, is he going to be starting next year? Probably not uh, because you have Kayvon Thibodeau and Brian Burns. He's going to be a primary backup. Does he want to stay in that role? Will he take a one-year deal elsewhere? He's probably going to see what his market looks like. And knowing the Giants, they're not going to give him you know what they what he wants, and he's going to go find an opportunity elsewhere to start full-time and maybe capitalize that, on that. So it's, it's a risk not trading him because he could end up walking for free. Um, and right now his stock is absolutely booming. You might be able to get a third round pick from a from a needy team uh, for him right now because a team that is in a postseason situation they desperately need a pass rusher like the Jets. By the way, the Jets are like the perfect team to go out and acquire a guy like Ojulari. In my opinion, I don't know what their draft capital situation looks like after the Devonte Adams trade, but they need help badly. Like Hassan Reddick, they're 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 letting him go seek a trade right now. Um, Will McDonald, you know, he's okay. He has some good games, bad games. Jermaine Johnson's injury was catastrophic for them. They're not generating enough pressure. That's a team that could use a piece like Ojolari. Like I said, Detroit could use a piece like Ojolari. Um, I just don't know what the draft capital return would be. But I think getting a third-round pick, especially after this past year's draft where we got a guy like Andrew Phillips, Andrew Phillips excuse me, in the third round, I don't think that that's a bad return you know what i mean like a third round pick's a good selection for a guy on an expiring contract that's probably i'd say let's say it's 50 50 chance that he stays or goes you get a third round pick for that 50 50 chance right like i i feel like that might be worthwhile for the giants um you know what's your take on that like that's uh, that's me playing devil's advocate i'm also like totally for extending him for what it's worth having a nice depth piece like him a guy that can start in any given week that's how you build a good roster if the giants get a new quarterback and they have a strong pass rush with depth that's perfect like that's that's what you want but there's no guarantee you can keep him because he may want to find a starting opportunity elsewhere that he can capitalize on. So that is that is a variable to consider in this equation. Well, he would have to be offered a starting opportunity elsewhere, and that's also not a guarantee. So it's kind of just these are one of these projection moments where we can't project what the future looks like. No crystal ball here on Fireside Giants, but we'll try our best to walk through the hypotheticals. And with Ojolari... 
Yeah, you're right in the sense where this last draft class was excellent. You know, so far it has been. Love the picks. Think that Joe Shane did a great job finding talent in those middle rounds. I think he did a good job the season prior as well. I mean, listen, Michael McFadden is another really good mid-round draft pick that the Giants have made. But we've also got the Marcus McKethans of the world. We have the uh, Josh Azidus of the world. There are a few of those mid-round picks that the Giants didn't necessarily hit on. It, it's The draft is a crapshoot. That's what it comes down to for me. You never know what you're going to get with any single draft pick. Hell, you can have a top seven overall pick in the draft, Alex. You can draft an absolute tank of an Alabama offensive tackle that's supposed to be your blindside protector or your frontside protector for 10 years, and he ends up starting 10 games for you and then never seeing the field again. That can happen. So whatever the Giants decide to trade Ojolari for, there is no guarantee that it's going to be a more impactful piece than what Ojolari is as a rotational pass rusher, and not just any rotational pass rusher, but a damn good one. Like, this is the guy who holds the Giants' record for most sacks as a rookie. Obviously, they weren't recording sacks during the Lawrence Taylor rookie season. If they were, he would hold the record. But since then, when they started recording sacks as an official statistic, Ojolari, 8.5 as a rookie, was a hell of a number to reach. And then he had 5.5 sacks the next season while playing significantly less minutes. He's dealt with a lot of injuries over the past two years, but you know what? I've always thought the injury issue with Aziz Ojolari was a little bit overblown. Going into the NFL... People said, oh, he's injury prone because there was this rumor this that this rumor that he had this knee injury that never got confirmed. I, I don't think he ever actually had that knee thing. In fact, I think Ojolari said in the media, I don't know where that came from because I never had a knee injury. So he kind of got hit with this injury label before he entered the NFL. And then he was like, I never had that injury. So was the injury label valid? He ended up getting injured two seasons later and missing a lot of time over the last two seasons. But now he's playing in this reduced role. There's less opportunity for him to get injured, and he's playing well. And this is a guy who many consider to be a first-round talent in 2021, fell to the second round because of that unsubstantiated rumor about a knee injury, fell to the second round. So the Giants got a first-round talent in round two. He looked like a first-round talent in his rookie season, hasn't been on the field enough. But for me, keep a stable of pass rushers. I watched this New York Giants team win two Super Bowls in 2007-8 and 2011-12, and the trademark of both of those teams was depth on the defensive line. I mean, both of those units just had hella pass rushers all over the place getting after the quarterback. The Giants don't exactly have that, but they have something close to it, and Ojolari is a key component of it. So I'm of the stance where add as much talent to this roster as you can, especially on these bargain deals and cheap contracts. And these draft picks, while I would love to have another draft class like this one where we hit on four picks and it looks great and everybody makes an immediate impact, you have to temper your expectations. You have to be realistic about it, especially with the quality of NFL draft classes in recent years. It's declining every single year because less players are actually going through the four-year development process. A lot of players are also staying because of NIL deals. There's a lot going on in the draft classes right now that makes them much tougher to project and much tougher to hit on your draft picks within. So, Right now, I think the Giants have a a proven commodity in some ways with Aziz Ojolari, and he's still a young talent that could be getting better year to year. So for me, that's a better deal than taking a mid-round draft pick. Uh, But, you know, there's definitely different ways to look at it. And one thing that I do know, whether the Giants add an extra draft pick for Aziz Ojolari or not, that 2025 draft class, Alex, it's going to be a crucial one. Absolutely. And for what it's worth, I do think that he will get a starting opportunity. There's always a dumb team out there. And he's a starting caliber player, as you just mentioned. Um, There's always a team out there willing to spend. I mean, look at the Jaguars. They gave, like, or or Tennessee, who gave Calvin Ridley all that money and can't even get in the football. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of teams out there that will be willing to spend a a pretty penny um, on a player like Ojolari, who's really in his prime right now, as you mentioned. So, you know, that's kind of the conversation you have to have. Um, do you run the risk of him walking anyway, or do you try to get the draft capital now? I mean, there is – the Giants don't have that many tradable pieces, I would say. A lot of them are young. A lot of them are on big contracts, and you want to keep those stars, right? You don't want to trade Thomas. You don't want to trade Dexter Lawrence. You don't want to trade Brian Burns. Um, do you like? Do you trade Bobby Okereke? I would not suggest that. He is the leader of that defense. Um, he is the manager. You know what I mean? He's the guy that's – stock on the shelves and putting things away and organizing. Like, that's the guy that does all the dirty work for us. Um, is Jason Pinnock a guy that could end up being traded? Maybe. 
maybe they would trade him and then put Dane Belton at strong safety. Um, maybe that's someone, a, a low-key guy to keep keep an eye on. I, I wouldn't suggest it. I don't think you're going to get much in, in return for him. I think he's on a one-year deal right now. Like, what are you really getting back, a sixth rounder? Like, might as well keep him and extend him um, on a cheap contract. So, you know, at the moment, if you're the Giants, it's like Darius Slayton and Aziz Ojolari. Like, those are the really valuable pieces that you have to move at this point. Um do you move Slayton? Well, you're losing the only guy that has chemistry with Daniel Jones, and, and like I said before, I'm of the I'm of the mindset that like I'm benching Daniel Jones if they if they lose this game against the Eagles. The Eagles are a bad football team right now. Their defense is susceptible. They have some injuries. This is there's no excuse for Daniel Jones to not tear them apart, in my opinion. So, but that that makes me want to ask you this question: If you think that benching Daniel Jones, like let's say a better quarterback stepped in and in his place, and this team is about a quarterback away from being competitive at the very least. Wouldn't that be the argument to keep these pieces? You're saying if I, to bench Daniel, no, I'm benching Daniel Jones because of the injury clause. No, no, no. Because I think anyone's better. No, I, okay, but I'm saying, (laughs) okay, the the argument here that I'm trying to make is, looking around the NFC, there's a lot of bad teams. The Giants, with a better quarterback, this is the argument that we made at the beginning of the episode, Mm -hmm. was with a better quarterback would be top of the NFC East, potentially. Sure, yeah. So why take this team that has these good pieces, that is a quarterback away from being competitive, and get rid of some of those pieces? That's kind of where I'm at. I like these pieces. I like Slate, and I like Ojolari. Yeah, they might walk in free agency, or you might re-sign them, because you're going to have an extra $20 million in cap space when you cut Daniel Jones, like you want to do. So if you're quarterback away... I think maybe keep those pieces. That might be the argument to do so. Yeah. So my argument against that would be I think Darius Slayton's leaving anyway, right? I think I think that he's gone. I don't think he ha- I don't think he has much loyalty for the Giants anymore. I think that he's they they did him dirty when he wanted a little bit more money. They said nope, sorry, buddy, and they they gave him a literal joke of an incentive to his contract. It was almost just like laughable. I don't think that they've. They've run this like a business, right? They have not run this with much loyalty to guys like Slayton, who took a pay cut, you know, worked his way back into the equation, and they were like, yeah, you're playing better, but we still don't want to extend you. I think he's gone after this. He's going to get money. Like, he's going to go get a Gabe Davis contract from a team that's stupid that wants to pay. You know what I mean? Like, they, he will get a decent deal. The Giants are not handing out $12, $13 million for Darius Slayton on a year, year-by-year basis. I just don't see it happening. So I think Slayton's gone anyway. And I think if, if anyone, they should trade him um, and not – a guy like Ojolari. If we're talking about those two guys and the probability, I'd rather trade Slayton than Ojolari because I genuinely think Slayton is walking anyway. I don't know if Ojolari will walk anyway. Like, there's very much a, a realistic way where he is extended in the Giants. Like, compete with Kayvon Thibodeau for that job. You know what I mean? Like, why not? Like, he, he has the talent. You know, he could win that job. They're seeing it right now, how much how much better he can be. And by the way, Kayvon Thibodeau was coming on before that injury. He had 10 pressures in two consecutive games. Or rather, he had 10 total pressures in those two games. So he was starting to look a lot better. Um, he was starting to find a rhythm and a groove. Injury was really ill-timed. But Ojolari has that talent to step in and be a, a competent starter on day one. I just think there is going to be a team that doesn't have a good pass rush um, that is willing to pay a guy like that. Like maybe the maybe like a team like the Panthers might be a team willing to give him some some money. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of like, let's see, pass rush, who's bad this year? The Bengals may be willing to. The Falcons could. I don't think they will, but they still have that big contract. Um, you know, the Titans could pay him. Uh, the Vikings could pay him if they transition to J.J. McCarthy, and, you know, they have a really, really affordable contracts across the board. Uh, the Jaguars could pay him. The Commanders is a te- are a team that could pay him. You know what I mean? There's so many football teams out here that probably view Aziz Ojolari as a good starting player when he's healthy and are willing to pay him at least a good portion of that. I don't know if the Giants are going to be able to match that, and I don't think they can guarantee him a starting job. So I, I think from my perspective is this. I think Slayton's gone for sure. I, I don't see a way that he stays. And I think it was Aziz Ojolari, the probability is that he leaves. So if the probability is more than 50% that he leaves, I feel as though they should try to get draft capital back right now for him. And, you know, like you said, you don't, I don't want to be trading pieces away um, that are good players and, you know, the Giants are hoping, hoping to get a quarterback next year. But they're going to have to draft a rookie. And I don't think that there's a rookie in next year's draft class that's going to have a Jaden Jaden Daniels impact or a, or a Caleb Wilson impact. You know what I mean? Like, you never know. It could happen. I just think based on pure evaluation, they're, they're not as good prospects uh, objectively. So you're probably going to have to suffer through a little bit of those, those rookie hiccups, at least for the first year. Um, I just don't know, man. Like, right now, I think Slayton's gone. I think Ojolari's probably leaving. He's going to get a better opportunity elsewhere. We already have two starters. Um, and you could probably draft somebody in the second or third round 
to develop behind those guys. And maybe you, maybe you sign an underrated player on a cheaper contract to be a backup. You know what I mean? Um, but it's, it's a good conversation nonetheless. Like, I, I'm cool going either way, to be quite frank, with, when it comes to Ojolari specifically. If we extended him, I would be happy with that. If we, if we traded him, I'd, I'd understand why, and I'd, and I'd really get the justification. Um, so like either way, I think I'm, I'm kind of content with the decision-making. But for now, it is something that we are going to be discussing leading up until November 5th on the trade deadline, and that's coming up fast. And the Giants, you know, if, he, if his stock is rising fast, I think you sell high personally, because his injury history is, I mean, it's not, he's been healthy, you know, he's been better, but I, I don't necessarily trust him just yet. I got to see him play like five or six straight games before I conclude that he's back and not injury prone. Um, so I, I think that if the, if his, if his stock is booming, you try to capitalize on that. Um, that's just kind of my take at this point though. I don't necessarily disagree with you. I kind of stand with you. Like, listen, I, I think the Giants should keep these players. Um, I'm, I'm a proponent of holding on to them and allowing them to continue to develop here and trying to sign them to bargain deals. Like, that's what I would like to do. However, you are right in the sense where if there is no guarantee that you can re-sign them, maybe you should get rid of them. I, listen, I'll understand if they trade them the same way you just said. You'll understand. I will also understand. I'd just like to see them stay. We'll see how it goes. Less than a month away from the trade deadline. Maybe the Giants make a move tomorrow. Maybe they make it in two weeks. Who knows? Of course, we'll have updates for you on any trade rumors surrounding the Giants right here on Fireside Giants. So make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you listen on Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go to follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we'll catch you on the next one. Have a good one, and let's go Giants.